Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, those of you listening on OPB FM and KBPS AM radio, and those of you watching on cable television. We are glad that you're all with us today for our second to the last Friday Forum of this year, on this Friday, the 12th of December, 2008. Today we'll hear for the first time from this podium the new president of Portland State University, who will share his ideas and perspectives regarding the role of universities in urban development. But before we begin our program, I have some announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, if you haven't already, please turn off your cell phones and other devices that might make noise. We are pleased to have four Friday Forum corporate sponsors again this quarter, <clears throat> without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our four corporate sponsors for this quarter are AARP Oregon, Comcast, Three Mile Canyon Farms, and the law firm Baron Liebman LLP. Now today is the last Friday of this City Club quarter, so let's give these sponsors for our last three months a special round of applause. Thank you. And I'm particularly pleased to have as our guest today from our corporate sponsor, the law firm Baron Liebman, Tracy Hopfe, who is the firm's man marketing manager, and Ed Harnden, the firm's managing partner. Tracy and Ed, if you could stand up and be recognized, we thank you and Baron Liebman for your support this quarter. We have one new City Club member with us today, Robert Krotzer, an intern architect at Hanabury Eddy Architects in downtown Portland. Robert, if you could stand, well, say hello to you. Thanks for being here. Now, at next week's Friday Forum on December 19th, we're pleased to welcome as our final speaker for 2008, Jonah Edelman, Executive Director of Stand for Children. Jonah will share his views on what Oregon's 2009 legislature can do, despite the economic downturn, to move Oregon schools into the nation's top tier. That's next week at Friday Forum. <clears throat> and although we will be taking a break in our Friday Forum schedule over the upcoming holidays, you can count on City Club to return in January with a full slate of engaging and important Friday Forum programs to start out the new year beginning with our traditional and exceedingly popular annual economic forecast panel of experts on January 9th. I think what, with what's been going on in the economy, we can expect a, a full room for that day, January 9th. And now to our program. It has become commonplace in urban and regional economic development circles in the United States and internationally to speak of the presence of a large research university or even of a cluster of such universities as being a necessary and critical precondition for an economically successful region and city of any significant scale. And in this vein, one of the very few factors that often is cited as being a negative for the future economic vitality of Portland in this region is the absence of a large research university, much less a cluster in this city and metro area. And yet, Portland State University sits on the inner south edge of Portland's downtown. With 27,000 students, it has become the largest university in the state. And to just pick one, uh, in such areas as land use, transportation, and regional development policy, it has become highly regarded. And just this fall, it was named the recipient of a $25 million matching grant to fund breakthrough research in the broad area of sustainability. Now meanwhile, just yesterday, at the Oregon Convention Center, there were a thousand members of Oregon's public, private, and nonprofit communities, including our governor, our state's legislative leaders, virtually our entire Oregon congressional delegation. They all participated in the annual Oregon Leadership Summit, during which the dominant theme, which was stated over and over all day long, was that although the recession is here and it's gonna to be tough in 2009 for Oregon, that the key to Oregon's future is to build on our existing economic strengths in, guess what areas? Energy efficient urban development, green building, renewable energy, and all things sustainable. So in other words, the consensus message was that the recession, even though tough, if we're smart during that recession, we'll focus now on the very things that PSU seems to be actually good at and getting better at. So considering all of this, 
how well equipped for economic success is this city and region, after all, given PSU's role and potential as our urban region's university. Indeed, acting on its motto, let knowledge serve the city, how can PSU help Portland and the Portland metro area develop and prosper? So to address these questions, City Club is very lucky to have with us today, making his first major public speech since uh, taking his new position in August, the new president of Portland State. Drawing on his career before moving to Portland and his perspectives gained since his arrival here five months ago, he will discuss how PSU and other urban universities can and should serve the cities and regions in which they are located and contribute to urban and metropolitan vitality. Now he is a native of the Netherlands. He earned his PhD in sociology in 1984 at Northwestern University in Illinois. He spent 25 years from 1979 to 2004 at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Among other roles at UIC, he served as the Dean of the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs and as the Director of the Center for Urban Economic Development. Immediately prior to coming to Portland State, he was Provost and Senior Vice President of Academic Affairs at the University of Baltimore in Maryland. And while there, he led a major initiative relating to the university's role in Baltimore's revitalization. Now during this career, our guest also managed to author or edit nine books and more than 65 articles relating to the role of universities in urban development. And then last August, as mentioned, he became the eighth president of Portland State. Now on a personal note, I have learned two things about our speaker that I want to share with you. He's laughing. First, during his career before moving to Portland for 30 years, and I want to repeat that, for 30 years, he took his own lunch to work. Now, more importantly, during those 30 years, he took the same lunch to work, one ham sandwich and one cheese sandwich. Now, the only exception was every once in a while, his wife Alice would prepare the lunch, and she would prepare two combined ham and cheese sandwiches. Now, however, and I think this says a lot about Portland and his integration into our special Portland culture, since becoming PSU, that 30 years of ham and cheese sandwiches is no more, because he is now eating restaurant and other more substantial fare every lunch in order to participate in all of the lunches, with all of the meetings, with all of the many people from this city, region, and state that want to talk to him. And this story leads to a, a related, somewhat related one because he's indicated a little concern of what this deviation from his 30 years of ham and cheese sandwiches might do to his waistline, and that suggests the possible need to get more exercise, and that in turn reminded him of the story about his first day on the job and how he got to work the first day on the job and then got home. And some of you may remember this, I actually remembered this when I heard this story because it was in the newspaper, I may have even got television coverage, I remember the article in the photo because our new PSU president on his first day at work went to work with our new mayoral ex Sam Adams and guess how they went to work together? They took the bike, their bikes together, they biked to work. Uh, and of course sustaining that mode of getting to and from work would be a great solution on any concern about deviating from ham and cheese sandwiches. But there was a problem. <clears throat> Our new uh, PSU president is a veteran of more flat terrain uh, in the Midwest and back East. And although equipped with that PhD trained mind, it wasn't until the end of that first day of work that he realized that the mayor elect had failed to tell him something. And that was that that night's nice, easy downhill ride to work in the morning was not such a nice uphill ride back home. So it's back to the drawing boards on what to do about the cheese sandwiches, and ham and cheese sandwiches. Uh, I also want to point out just two other quick things. Uh, although this is the first time that he's speaking to us today, uh, this is the third time in his quick tenure that he's been to our Friday forums, and I think that speaks a lot about his interest in this community and, and uh, public issues. And knowing how busy he's been, he's been with us before. And uh, finally, let's talk about the name, uh, the pronunciation of the name. And I've talked with him about this, so it's okay. Uh, here's what I've come up with about our new PSU president's name. Uh, you only need to know seven things to know how to pronounce his name. <laughs> First of all, it's Dutch. Uh, it has three W's in it, and because it's Dutch, uh, the W's are pronounced as some form of V. I can't remember exactly, but it's a form of V. The first syllable of the last name is not pronounced like his first name. 
The first syllable of his last name reminds, rhymes with the word B, and the emphasis in his last name is on the first syllable, not the last syllable. So where does this all take us? It takes us to giving a very warm City Club welcome for the very first time to our new uh, Portland State President, Vim Vivel. Vim? Well, Jim, if you'd gone on any longer, I wouldn't have any secrets left. Uh, you exemplify what happens when one's spouse gets together with one's executive assistant. There are no, no secrets left. I have to tell you, I did actually bring my sandwich today because I meant to eat it before uh, I got the food here, but then I didn't even have the time. Um, you've heard uh, a little bit how uh, I have uh, risen to the ranks to now be president of Portland State. Among presidents, uh, the most common analogy for our role is that we are like the groundskeepers in a cemetery. We have a lot of people underneath us and none of them listens to what we say. <laughs> now, I've been struck since coming here by the similarities between Portland and my native uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and it's not just the fact that we ride bikes. Uh, indeed, there are no hills at all in the Netherlands. And after all those years of riding bikes there, I learned to hate biking in the rain. Always hated it. Um, so there is a similarity to biking and the weather. But more importantly, I've been struck by the wonderful uh, attitude that people have here. The great egalitarianism, great deal of progressivism, uh, a level of funkiness, which kind of provides a nice mix. I've also been really impressed by the extent of public-private partnerships and the very clear respect that the public and the private sector have for each other's roles. And I think the Oregon Leadership Summit yesterday showed it off very nicely. Finally, I've, I've been meeting with many uh, politicians, legislate, legislators as well as other politicians in the last three months, and I've become truly impressed by the uh, quality uh, of their background, their commitment, their experience, as well as the feeling about the general uh, cleanliness of the politics here. Now, I suppose that since I spent 25 years in Illinois, that's damning with pretty faint praise, but ne <laughs> nevertheless. I want to start by talking about uh, five key challenges that higher education really nationwide faces. And then, uh, uh, lest you get too depressed by that, uh, because there is, of course, bad news in that, uh, I will talk uh, then about the five main focal areas that many universities, especially many urban universities, and, espe and especially Portland State, uh, have taken to address these challenges. So let me take you through that. And the first challenge, you will not be surprised in these days of bad economic news, relates to the issue as well as the perception of the rapidly increasing cost of higher education. Now just two weeks ago there was a new report that you may have read about that talked about the fact that the cost of attending college uh, over the last 20 years had risen at three times the consumer price index. Now the problem with a report like that is uh, a couple. One is that it tends to throw together public and private universities. Everybody loves to hear about how it now costs almost $50,000 a year for tuition, room, and board to go to Harvard, Princeton, Brown, or for that matter, Lewis and Clark and Reed. Um, but it's a very confusing number because that puts together the publics and the privates. The other thing that reports like, do, like that tend to do is that they put together cost and price and don't always distinguish very clearly. At Portland State University, and generally throughout the Oregon University system, the actual cost per capita, measured as what we actually have to spend every year, just about uh, doubled over the last 20 years, from about 4,500 to about $9,000 per student. During that same time, the consumer price index went up by about 75%, Median family income doubled during that time. So, in fact, when measured against family median income, the costs stayed exactly the same over those 20 years. And this is in spite 
of the fact that at Portland State, we educate far more graduate students who are more expensive to educate. There are far more federal regulations. There are increased expectations regarding technology, the quality of space, quality of service, etc. However, it is true that the price for an undergraduate has gone up a lot. 20 years ago, it was $1,540. Uh, tuition and fees for full-time undergraduates. Uh, last year, it was in the mid 5,000s. That's an increase of close to 250%. So that is indeed much more than inflation. Now, why did that happen? Very simple. Because the direct state support per capita only rose from $3,100, $3,100 per student 20 years ago, to $3,750 now. That's in 20 years. Now remember, these are real dollars. These are not inflation adjusted dollars. So in 20 years, we get $650 more per student to do the education. Indeed, Oregon ranks 44th among states in its appropriations per student FTE. Now, you can see then what has happened. State support goes down certainly one suggested for inflation, the money's got to come from somewhere, so tuition has been going up like that. The problem we have is that it doesn't work to keep tuition low and to have low support. Even though tuition has gone up so much, it is still low compared to most places in the nation. Oregon ranks about in the middle uh, as a state compared to other states. But to give you just some comparisons, in Maryland, full-time tuition for a resident undergraduate is about $8,000. In Illinois, it's $10,000. In New Jersey, it's up to $11,000. We are now uh, lower than most of our surrounding states. And even a state like Florida, which kept the tuition very low for many years, about in the, in the middle 2000s, has now agreed that over the next six years, they will be ra ra raising tuition uh, at about 15% a year until it gets to the national average. The result, of course, of keeping funding at these levels is that it results in high student-faculty ratios, fewer staff, low faculty salaries, deferred maintenance, and so on. So this is a national problem, but it's particularly severe here in Oregon. And frankly, of all the things that surprised me when I came to Portland and Oregon, this was the key one. I had naively assumed that sort of as part of the great progressive Northwest, higher education would be funded well. Now, I have to admit, I did find out before I accepted the job. It certainly gave me some pause before I did. Now, the second big challenge relates to the changing demographics. Many of you may have heard these numbers from Portland's higher education agenda for the 21st century. Of the 500,000 new Portlanders over the next 20 years, about 25% is expected to be Hispanic. Indeed, by 2017 already, Latinos are projected to constitute one quarter of Oregon high school graduates. And for the first time in 60 years, Oregon's older adults are now better educated than younger adults. This demographic change is a real problem. As you heard from Superintendent Carol Smith when she talked to you a couple of months ago, in Portland's third grades, white students and minority students perform almost similarly. But by 10th grade, twice as many white students are at grade level as minority students, and white students in the end are two to three times more likely to graduate from college. So with this demographic change, we have an achievement gap change that so far we have been uh, not capable of really fully addressing. And if we don't address the achievement gap before students come to college, there will of course not be enough qualified students and not enough qualified workers. This is a tremendous challenge, but it is one that we must take on both for moral reasons as well as, of course, for our self-interested economic reasons. It's something that particularly urban universities must deal with. The third major challenge that all of higher education faces, and I'll be briefer about this, is that of rapid technological change. 
We need state-of-the-art science, computing, and engineering facilities to facilitate world-class research. Indeed, over the years, I've done a lot of research on university real estate development. And the two biggest drivers of university real estate development are A, just sheer growth, bigger numbers, so you need more. But the second one is the new space that is needed to have state-of-the-art facilities, especially in science and engineering, where you just cannot do the work unless you have those facilities. We also, in terms of rapid technological change, need to invest in technology-based administrative systems and web-based learning capability. But the good thing about this emphasis on technological change is that it puts a premium on knowledge and research, and that's what universities do. So on the whole, being in a time where this is changing so rapidly, I think also re-emphasizes the importance of what universities do, and I see it as a great opportunity. Similarly, with the fourth challenge, the demands for accountability. You've all heard about the Spellings Commission, which demanded tougher accreditation, focus on student learning outcomes, and more intrusive and standardized reporting. Uh, this will not go away with the departure of Secretary Spellings. I think this is part of looking at costs and the performance that comes with those costs. So we need to continue to focus on that. It is a challenge, and it increases cost, but at the same time, I see this emphasis on accountability as an opportunity for renewal and improvement, as it forces us to really rethink what we do, what we achieve, and how we do so. The fifth challenge is really a very broad one, and I think it's the way in which society increasingly looks at higher education to address a very broad range of challenges. We are expected not just to educate the workforce in general, but to contribute to economic development and global competitiveness, to address global warming and sustainability, to increase civic awareness, uh, to solve urban problems. Now, for Portland State and for many other urban universities, these are not bad things because we have been so engaged in these activities already that it's an opportunity for us to show how we contribute to society. But of course, it is a problem that the resources are never enough to do it all and that faculty feel stressed by the multiplicity of demands on, on their time. So how is higher education and how does Portland State address these challenges? And here too, even though sociologists usually do things in force, I will have five five points. And those are summarized, by the way, in the uh, little leaflets that are on your table that you can take with you. You can't read it while I'm talking. <laughs> the first area of focus relate, we call provide civic leadership through partnerships. And this is really at the core what brought me to Portland and what has driven my academic career over the last 30 years. It's been about how do we make the university relevant to what goes on in the city? How do we contribute both to the social justice and equity concerns that are so visible as problems in the city? And how do we remain true to the mission of the university as developer and uh, disseminator of knowledge? Indeed, universities throughout the country now describe themselves as engaged urban universities. It means that the university's academic and administrative resources across the board address the challenges and opportunities in the metropolitan area in partnership with other stakeholders. It represents a change from the notion of the pastoral campus where truth, beauty, and knowledge we're supposed to thrive in splendid isolation to realization that knowledge resides in many sectors of society and is best created and advanced by collaboration. Indeed, that, that knowledge is advanced most by addressing serious problems of society rather than the abstract games that one might come up with. Now, in a global society, we believe that city regions are the key economic entities 
and that urban competitiveness is based on knowledge. And therefore, universities have to play a key role in this new economy. In a report by the group CEOs for Cities, they point out that urban universities and college constitute two-thirds, a full two-thirds, or 1,900, of the United States' 3,400 institutions of higher education. Collectively, these urban universities and colleges spend about 250 billion a year. Now, 250 billion used to be a pretty big number until this fall, and now nothing counts anymore unless you got at least a trillion. And with that 250 billion, we employ about 2 million people to educate 10 million students. So we believe that as key players in the knowledge economy, universities have to play a local leadership role to help address the whole range of issues that shapes the viability of the region, not just those issues that affect the university narrowly. This is even further emphasized by the fact that, as you know, many universities and medical institutions, which together often are referred to as the eds and the meds, um, have become the dominant economic player in many towns and cities that are not traditional college towns. Johns Hopkins University is the largest private employer, not just in Baltimore, but actually in all of Maryland. Uh, University of Pennsylvania is the largest employer in Philadelphia. In Boston, the Eds and the Mets are by far the largest employer. And the same is increasingly true in cities like Phoenix, Arizona, St. Louis, Missouri, Indianapolis, Buffalo, and even in a large city like Chicago. Indeed, you could say that we have become the local blue chips, the local growth machine. It used to be a city like Portland and other cities this size would be run by a local growth machine consisting of the local newspaper, the local utility company, the local department store, the local bank, and the major local manufacturer. And then there were sort of ancillary groups around that. Well, as you know, the local newspaper is no longer owned here. The local bank is owned in Charlotte, North Carolina. The local department store is owned in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The local manufacturing company is owned by a hedge fund somewhere. And really, there is not a business representative in this room here today who can be sure, frankly, that the business will still be here a year from now, much less 50 years from now or 100 years from now. But I will guarantee you that Portland State University will still be here 50 years from now, barring any major earthquakes, or 100 years from now. Now, it may be called Portland State Health and Science University, just to throw out something, but it will still be here. To make this concrete, in terms of Portland State, as was mentioned earlier, we have 27,000 students. We employ 3,500 faculty and staff full-time, as well as thousands of student workers, with a payroll of $205 million. We purchase $150 million a year in goods and services. We bring in $36 million a year in research funding from outside of the state. And our total economic impact this past year on the Portland region was just over a billion dollars. In addition to that uh, financial impact, our students complete more than 230 community-based research projects each year and contribute about a million and a half volunteer hours annually. Our business outreach program has assisted more than 500 small and emerging businesses over the last 10 years and contributed over 5,000 hours of service just this past year. And over the past five years, our real, real estate development is worth about $140 million. These are big numbers. This is a big impact. So therefore, we want to continue to enhance and support local leadership roles, not just by the president, but involvement by all of our faculty, staff, students, and administration. We want to constantly renew the nature of our engaged learning, 
and we want to be creative about the role of the sciences in partnership with industry. We want to renew and expand our partnerships and collaborations with the civic, public, and business sectors on research, demonstration, education, cultural, and real estate development projects. Now the second theme though, after civic leadership, is to focus on enhancing the student experience because you cannot be a civic leader if you do not take care of your core mission, if you don't take care of home. For Portland State, some key changes in this regard will be to continue to expand the housing on campus. Right now, we have 2,030 beds on campus. I'd love to see four or perhaps even 5,000 because it's by housing students that both we will be able to attract more students from out of state, which is important for a number of reasons, but we will also be able to create a better quality of life. We know that that will help build support for our student organization clubs, for our athletic teams, and the more you get that, the more engaged people are and therefore the more successful they will be. Indeed, I want to have a traditional, but a traditional urban campus, as well as a university that appeals to our traditional audiences of transfer students and of course a very selective uh, graduate campus as well. We will also pay more attention uh, to advising. I would love to have a better student-faculty ratio. There are a whole bunch of things that are perhaps more relevant to the institution internally that will contribute to making sure that the student experience is as good and as strong as it can be. The third theme I talk about is achieving global excellence. To be competitive, we need excellence, not just adequacy. Indeed, I've been saying the residents of the Portland region are entitled to a public university that's not just adequate, but that's excellent. You should not have to go out of town or pay private sector tuition to get an excellent education. It should be available to the public in your public university. Now, to be excellent involves making choices because you cannot be excellent, equally excellent in everything. That's not realistic. So we have focused on sustainability as a lead theme. Indeed, we picked that already uh, last year in a strategic planning process that predated me because it was clear that that was an area where we had a lot of strength that transcended individual departments and colleges and that, of course, creates a tremendous branding synergy with the brand that Portland and Oregon already have. And I think over the last six months even, we've seen just an incredibly increased attention to that and realization of how sustainability does not just make sense and is not just a good thing, but indeed holds promise for leading us out of the current economic downturn. Now, we then got lucky. It's always better to be lucky than smart. The Miller Foundation came along and decided, you know, what they actually decided was that they wanted to make a difference for Portland. And then they polled all their trustees and asked them, how can we make the biggest difference for Portland? And they decided that by investing in the public university, they could achieve that. And then they came to us and said, if we were to give you $25 million, what would you spend it on? And it was in the dialogue with them that really they then said clearly what you care most about and where, where you can become globally excellent is this area of sustainability. So that's where we want you to spend the money. And we just ran an internal competition uh, to get faculty to come up with proposals. And they submitted uh, just about 100 proposals for a total of, of course, about $7 million for the about one and a half million that we're going to give out in this first round. Some of you may know that uh, managing faculty has been uh, likened to herding cats. And I soon found out that the way you herd cats is by rattling the food bowl. <laughs> $25 million is a really good food bowl. And it's wonderful because it has incentivized faculty to think about their work and how it can contribute 
to the future sustainability of the region. And, and so we get uh, lots of creativity in areas like green building technology, uh, issues of transportation management, uh, bike and pedestrian safety, um, issues of measurement, both of new technologies, new processes, water quality, business performance, uh, issues of land use policy, as well as social health and sustainability, because of course we focus, focus on the triple bottom line of environmental, economic, and social sustainability. One of the exciting parts of the governor's uh, proposed budget includes uh, $80 million in bonding authority to build a sustainability center that would bring together a lot of the sustainability focused organizations in Portland and we are very hopeful that this would be located uh, on or immediately adjacent to our campus. And that's just one example of that synergy uh, coming together. Now, in addition to sustainability, there are other areas of excellence that transcend just individual departments. Uh, we will greatly expand the collaboration that we already have with our colleagues up on the hill at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, they make more money than we do, but we love working with them anyway. Um, we want to work uh, on the areas of science and community health. Uh, we want to, uh, we already provide most of the students to their uh, medical school. We will get more and more involved in the medical training that they do. There are a lot of opportunities for joint appointments, joint degrees, and so on. We will also, separate from that, continue to build on our expertise in urban issues. And there will be many other individual areas in departments that will also matter to us. As a result of a focus on excellence, we intend to attract the best out-of-state students. We want to increase the percentage of out-of-state students from the current 20 to 30 percent, both because that's a hallmark of excellence and, frankly, because they provide us with more resources to provide the education. We will improve our labs. Uh, we will build a new life sciences center uh, together with OHSU, OSU, and others on the waterfront. And we will enhance our diversity and international education efforts. The fourth theme that I will talk about just briefly relates to expanding educational opportunity. We want to work with all the other partners in the whole P through 20 system to address the achievement gap. One of the first things I did when I came was meet with Superintendent Carol Smith and we created a joint task force to find out how we can more strategically partner with the Portland Public Schools to make sure that they perform and that they produce the graduates who are able to do work at the university level. We will also expand our programs for knowledge sector workers, professional masters and PhDs. And we will expand delivery modes, as all urban universities are doing. We will do web-based learning, not because it's cheaper, because if it's done right, it actually isn't very much cheaper, but because it meets the needs of a working age population. You cannot say that you're here to serve working adults and then tell them, but you gotta come to class Tuesday and Thursday from four to six. Because when people have children, when people have jobs, they want to be able to get their education when it fits their schedule, not just when it fits hours. And we will work with business and the public sector to raise funds for scholarships to maintain and expand access. Because as you all know, that expanding access pays. Indeed, every dollar spent on equalizing college entrance rates for racial and ethnic groups yields about three dollars in public savings. And if one adds the taxes from increased earnings, the total return on investment is in the four to five dollar range. Now that brings us to the fifth topic of our theme of maximizing resources and efficiency, and then I'll wrap up. My first point that I've been making to people is that there will never be enough money to do what we want. If there ever were, it would mean that we stopped hoping and dreaming. Indeed, I have many colleagues at Harvard and they always complain about not having enough money to do what they want to do. And you know what? They're right. Because they want to do more and they have great ideas. So the fact that we don't have enough money, that's nothing new. Um, we will, therefore, continue to push for getting more resources without sitting down and whining about it. 
We will double external grants and contracts over the next six years. We will increase philanthropic support, even though we will have a blip now, of course. We're not unaware. Um, but on the whole, as a public university in this region, we have not even come close to tapping the level of philanthropic support that is available. We will continue to engage in development with our partners for, for equipment, with corporations, for real estate, with multi-use projects, and so on. And of course, we will strongly advocate for state support. We are very grateful for the governor for his budget proposal that does to some extent protect education. But even with his best efforts, uh, the budget still falls short of the essential budget level. And it does not uh, pay us for the enrollment growth we had in the last six years. And it does not allow us to make progress on bringing faculty salaries to that of peers. And it does not allow us to reduce student-faculty ratios. And of course, as you all know, the budget now is probably as good as it's going to get uh, as the projections deteriorate next spring. The legislature is likely to make cuts. And inevitably, if those cuts become too severe, we will have no choice but to begin to talk about larger tuition increases than the current 3.6% that's comp contemplated. Um, so we hope that we will both be working with others on other sources of public funding for scholarships. Can Metro do things? Can counties do things? Can the city do things? Can corporations do things? But in the end, the truth is that for me to be a very successful advocate for my own institution or for higher education collectively to be a very good advocate for higher education is not enough. The pie simply is not large enough. And until we change the fiscal structure of the state, it will be impossible to build a first-rate higher education system. Now let me just wrap up. First of all, I want to tell you that we practice what we preach. Uh, we have just over the last few weeks developed a new program to bring more Portland State University people to the City Club lunches. And today we have 15 new faculty, staff, and administrators who have agreed to join the City Club and have also agreed to bring a student with to all the lunches. I would like, please, all the Portland State University people who are here today to stand up. I figured this way at least I'd have somebody laughing at my jokes. <laughs> I see this discussion as the beginning of a dialogue. And indeed, if five or ten years from now, our main achievements are what we can anticipate now, we have not really succeeded because we have not been sufficiently transformational. I see this as a beginning, and I welcome the opportunity to work with you to transform both Portland State and the Portland region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Vivel. Uh, I want to particularly thank you for your leadership in uh, helping uh, this new effort of uh, bringing uh, faculty and staff and students into uh, City Club. Some of us uh, sort of bumped into people from PSU and started talking about this, and uh, it's just great that under your administration they've actually followed through. So uh, we are very appreciative and look forward uh, to more collaboration in the future from these uh, two great Portland institutions. Uh, the first question of our speaker, as always, will be from our board host. Uh, our board host today is Melody Rose. Uh, now, Melody Rose is the chair of the political, uh, political science at Portland State. Now, I'm tempted here to ask us to break out in focus groups and discuss why Melody thinks this is a good career move to ask her boss a question in front of 20,000 people on radio, television, and room for, but anyway, we won't. <clears throat> um, Melody has been a City Club member since 2003. She is the chairman of the Friday Forum Committee that arranges these uh, Friday Forums every week. She, uh, this is her first uh, year on the Board of Governors. Melody? Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, President.
boss. Uh, I, I must admit a, a wee bit of trepidation at asking my new boss a question in front of an audience of 20,000. Um, but that being said, I am one of the cats, and so I'll ask something about the food bowl. In your comments, you alluded to the tension that I'm going to lay out. There is something of a tension between this need to keep tuition low. In fact, there's been quite a lot of national attention to that issue over the past few weeks. And on the other side of that equation, of course, there's a lot of local interest in making sure that we, we procure and reward and keep really strong faculty, hence the food bowl. So my question is, in this economic climate and with the priorities that you've laid out, how do you manage that tension between keeping prices low for students uh, and keeping faculty here? Well, as you also know, uh, Melody is a tenured full professor. <laughs> and tenured full professors have never worried about <laughs> asking any question of their president. She also reminded me that she served on the negotiation team with the Factor Union last spring. <laughs> and I'm very appreciative of your efforts in settling that issue before I came to town. I came here to preside over an excellent institution, not a mediocre institution. And I know that paying people in trees only goes so far. And I know that people in Portland State have essentially been getting paid in nature, in quality of life. And while that is real, in the long run, you cannot continue to run the institution that way. So I'm very committed to having an institution that pays its faculty competitively, that rewards performance and merit, and to seek to do that in the best way we can, obviously within the, within the political constraints we have. But that's why I've made the point, and I've begun to have discussions, I've been having discussions with our student leadership to get their support and understanding for the issue of the quality of the education they get and that just keeping tuition low and funding low in the end has a deleterious effects, effect on quality. And to hope to work here what worked in Illinois and what worked in Maryland where students and faculty and administrators really were able to jointly talk about performance, were able to create in Maryland a compact with the legislature, which included certain performance criteria. And in exchange for that, the legislature committed itself to always either providing the funding or allowing institutions to raise tuition so that it would actually have the money to achieve certain standards of faculty salaries. I think there are a lot of things that need to be done. Again, in the end, it will require change in the fiscal structure to generate the resources, because otherwise we have to go to tuition. Now, let me also talk about tuition, though, that every time when we raise tuition, we will be looking at ways to steer a portion of that increase to scholarships to support those who are least able to pay the price. Uh, I believe in education as a public good. I grew up in a country where we literally, we demonstrated in the streets in 1969 when the Dutch government raised tuition from 20 guilders a year to 100 guilders a year. That's about from five bucks to 15 bucks. I believe in education as a public good, but it takes a whole state to believe that, to be able to pull that out. Uh, this is the time we'll take questions from the floor. We have a microphone on the left, a room full of people. You must have questions. Uh, remember that uh, asking questions at Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership, so please state your name, your uh, status as a member. Keep your questions to uh, 30 seconds or less and, and try to have it actually be a question. Okay. Thank you. Tom Cox, City Club member, uh, token Republican, and... Uh, member of the Board of Governors. Uh, sir, thank you for being here. Your theme today included the issue of sustainability. We here at the club believe our regional health and sustainability must include robust civic engagement. What do you see as the future of civic engagement, both PSU's role in it and more broadly? Absolutely, and it's precisely an example of our belief in the importance of civic engagement is 
uh, what we just talked about, bringing people to an organization like this and having our students come along as well to make it very clear that the engagement uh, expresses itself at all levels. It's uh, a faculty member doing research on the transportation issues, on land use issues. Uh, it's our faculty in fine and performing arts being engaged with the Arts Museum, the Oregon Historical Society, and with other theater groups. It's bringing people to political debates. It's hosting fora and political speakers and others to come to campus, engaging in debates. It's that whole range of activities that makes a university a lively place and a forum where the issues of the day can be discussed and where we can help uh, work on solutions. Uh, another example of that is our Oregon Solutions Program, uh, a very large program in our College of Urban and Public Affairs that works with cities and towns throughout Oregon on really nasty issues of coordination and integration between public bodies, private bodies, state agencies, county agencies, and local agencies to uh, work on how they can work together to improve local conditions. So it's a whole range of projects that we're engaged in to promote civic awareness and civic engagement that way. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name's Tamara de Ritter, another Dutch name. My, uh, both my grandparents came from Belgium. And I am an alum from uh, PSU in planning. And I've been a planning director in four different cities in the metro area currently own my own business, so I hope it's not going to go under anytime soon or get outsourced. But um, the economy is the way it is. My question to you is in regards to sustainability. You touched on a number of different uh, items about that topic, and sustainability means something different to everyone. So my uh, question is that for Portland and the Portland metro area, since the port of, I mean, Actually, PSU was located at Vanport to begin with. It kind of got washed out and moved. And I think we, we uh, need to learn from our history of the region that it isn't a stable environment physically. And we anticipate a, a major change along the coast here shortly because it's been over 300 years since we've had our last tsunami. The question I have for you is with the rising sea level and changes that are happening along our coastline, how can we best create think tanks to prepare ourselves for the changing climate? Well, uh, having been uh, born and raised in a city that's uh, about 10 feet below sea level, I'm <laughs> very sympathetic to that, <laughs> to that question. Um, and, and I sort of feel, uh, feel happy that here at least we're, uh, what, about a, 150 feet above, above sea level or something like that, and, and hope, to, hope to stay that way. But there's a lot of research uh, that goes on. It, it, all of this, as you know, is, is part of the larger climate change and carbon emissions issue. And there is research that both is going on at PSU, at OHSU, at OSU, at uh, University of Oregon, as well as, of course, worldwide, to address those issues. Uh, what has happened, I think, it's just amazing the last few years, is the increased awareness. I, I think you know, it, it's very rare, I think, in society to be able to see an issue rise so quickly to such a high level of prominence. And I think it was really uh, Al Gore's uh, an, an uncomfortable, uncomfortable truth that, uh, that really uh, brought, that, uh, brought that home to everybody. So we are part of the research on those issues, and uh, in a way, in, in Oregon, it doesn't even play out nearly as severely, uh, of course, as it does in places like the Netherlands and Florida and New Orleans, but we are definitely part of that whole circle of research. John Leeper, City Club member. I appreciate your comments on sustainability, sir. However, it seems to me that uh, PSU has had a strong uh, study effort and a list of considerable accomplishments on urban planning and uh, demographic studies. And I would just like to uh, get some assurance from you in that uh, you didn't mention them that they are going to continue to be high priority projects and processes in the university. 
Well, absolutely, uh, and, and uh, I have to be uh, always very careful because uh, my tenure is in uh, the urban planning department. My dean is sitting here, uh, so I would be indeed remiss if I did not mention it. I think I did mention it as the third area of excellence, uh, sustainability being one, uh, our collaboration with Oregon Health and Science University around health issues and science as second, and then our uh, national prominence in uh, urban policy and land use issue uh, issues as third, for, as something that really does uh, not just focus in one department, but that transcends the institution. Now, what's been so wonderful about it that clearly that issue, the focus in urban planning, is so much related to sustainability. So it's a very integral part of what we do and what we will continue to do. Yes. Uh, Gilly Burlingham, a City Club member and undergraduate from Northwestern, located in Evanston, a suburb of Chicago. And I'm, parenthetically, I'm really cross that all the national commentators say Chicago. No, just like Oregon. It's Chicago, please, thank you. Okay, um, the previous uh, president was a Northwestern grad, although he said he never stepped foot on the Evanston campus because he got his law degree downtown in Chicago. Uh, he outlined to our alumni association that he was working very hard to bring foreign students in and uh, I think he had a great many from China. What are you contemplating in terms of either carrying on the policy of bringing foreign students in or otherwise? Yes, right now about 6% of our student body is from abroad, uh, and we hope to grow that to about 10%. Uh, it's part of that, because uh, then another 14% comes from out of state, but within the United States, and we hope to grow that to 20. So that the total uh, number of students from out of states will be, will be 30. So I want to grow that from 6 to 10%. Uh, as you know, we've historically had a very strong uh, student component from the Middle East. Uh, right now, I think we have about 450 students from the Middle East on campus. We look forward to continuing that and also expanding that. And then, of course, we already have lots of students from uh, China, India, Korea, uh, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, lots, of, lots of other countries. And, uh, in fact, at, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, uh, we had just a, a small selection, 35 of those students representing 13 different nationalities uh, at our home to really, both because it was just fun uh, and I wanted to give them a chance to eat a real American meal, but also just to symbolize our commitment to the international aspect of Portland State because it's such a critical part of who we are as a region and the future of our region. Uh, hi, my name is John Sanford. I've been a member for four minutes. I just signed up to come and ask you this question. Um, uh, I am a student at Portland State. I'm a veteran as well. I served eight years in the Army. Um, and I came... Thanks. Sorry. And I came to Portland State um, expecting to have liberal education and a lot of support for veterans community and that type of such. Um, now, Port uh, student veterans of Portland State have had a hard time finding space, getting any type of support, it seems. And something that's come up onto your plate, which I'm sure you've talked to someone about just lately, is having space for veterans specifically on campus. Now, they're 10% they're of your population. You know, they're a very active member, and Vanport College is built off veterans. Do you support a one-stop shop, a place specifically for veterans on campus to get support? And what will you do with that population uh, on campus? How will you support them? Yeah, I'm not gonna make management decisions uh, right here, of course, but uh, I had a very productive meeting with representatives from the veterans groups uh, very recently, and uh, because there are some very special needs that they have, I think having a place where they know they can go and find out, both get the key things like the certification done right there, and find out where everything else that needs to be done that other students also need gets done makes a lot of sense. So we've been supportive of that and we're now in the process of identifying appropriate space. This will have to be our last question. Robert Liberty, City Club member and Metro Councilor. I was wondering if you could address the opportunities for collaboration in the area of urban planning, design, and sustainability with other universities in Oregon, in Washington, and British Columbia. 
is there some advantage of creating some sort of virtual sustainability university where we can draw in faculties from seven or eight or nine institutions, allow us to specialize and really make a mark as a larger region and provide opportunity for specialization and leadership for Portland State University in those fields? Well, some people agree with you. Uh, <laughs> no, absolutely. Again, one of, the, one of the ways that you build a great university is by having faculty both themselves take the initiative and be selected by others to go in on joint research projects. And a lot of that is happening already. Nowadays, to get funding from NSF, NIH, all these other organizations, you usually need to put together broad teams. And our faculty are already very successful at that. As you know, sustainability is not just a priority for uh, Portland State University, but for the whole Oregon University system. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask my wife, uh, Alice, to uh, stand up uh, because she is the director of capital planning for Oregon University System, but is also their coordinator for their sustainability efforts. And she's a partner with us in all of this. And we will also uh, expand that to uh, universities elsewhere. In fact, we are in discussions right now with some of the people from Washington State as well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Alice, we're all interested to know how much you like ham and cheese as well, but you can ask her separately. Um, thank you all. Uh, be here next week for Jonah Edelman. We're going to talk, if we're here from Stan from Children. And as we break, uh, he's only been here five months. It's going to be very interesting to hear him again next year. We're very happy he's here. President Vavell, thanks for being here. And we're adjourned. <laughs>